Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 866, and I have a special guest. All right, thank you for joining us for another program of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. As you can see, I have a very new Archbishop, not installed, but certainly elected, to the ACNA. And we're going to talk a little bit uh, about his new role in the uh, Anglican Church in North America. Uh, Steve, how you doing? I'm doing well, Kevin. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you and your audience today. Um, certainly have appreciated what you and George have done over the years. And um, and absolutely delighted uh, to be on this call with you today. I'm doing well. Uh, it's a typical summer day in South Carolina, and so sun's out, and uh, so is the heat. Yeah, uh, though the heat, the humidity, uh, yeah, it, it's a, it, all it, of it. It's oppressive. So before we get too too far into this, we had a couple technical uh, issues in the pre-show. We hope that doesn't come over into this show, but we'll see what happens. Lord, help us. And I bet you've said yes. that recently. <laughs> so uh, Often, throughout the day, many times. <laughs> so uh, let's just give the, the, the audience and the Anglicans a, a little bit uh, about the, the background of Steve Wood, Archbishop Steve Wood. Where did you grow up? Yeah, I grew up in northeast Ohio, uh, mm -hmm. probably 20 minutes uh, east of Cleveland, right on Lake Erie, and um, spent spent my entire childhood there probably lived there till mid well i went to seminary but then back right to about 30 and then down mm -hmm. to the akron area when i wanted staff at a church down there mm -hmm. and how did you graduate over to south carolina um well you know i i'd been at my first parish for five years uh saint anna madison uh way northeast corner of ohio went from there to saint luke's bath uh, to work with Roger Ames uh, when we were there. I was there probably almost another five years. And quite literally, um, it was a January day in 2000. And it was, I think I'd said somewhere that we'd had about a month of consecutive sub-freezing days. And, um, and I got a phone call uh, from a woman on the other end of the phone that gave me her name and said she was on the search committee at a church named St. Andrews in Mount Pleasant and wanted to know if I would be interested in having a conversation about being their rector. Mm. And, um, and, and I was, um, I knew a bit about St. Andrews, uh, reputationally. Uh, I knew, uh, Bishop Terrell Glenn was then the rector here and a very good friend of mine from seminary had served on Terrell's staff for five years as their uh, worship leader. And so, um, we'd been down here, we'd visited, um, and, um, and we're very happy uh, to have a conversation about, what the Lord might be doing. Hmm. Tell me a little bit about your family. What, how, tell me about your parents. Yeah, um, my mom and dad, both deceased. Um, my mom grew up a little bit of everywhere, spent early part of her life on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, uh, and then boarding school for a while in Scotland, and then uh, ended up in Ohio um, when they moved back at some point, probably around late high school, I guess she moved to Ohio with her father her mother died while she was a young girl um and um my mom was episcopal uh saint james madison avenue was her church as a girl and then um england church when she was in scotland and then another episcopal church when she was back in ohio my dad was from the missouri ozarks um uh, my mom and dad were a fun couple uh, very very different mm -hmm. um, my dad grew up with um very different religious background. Um, Rocky Mountain Union Baptist Church yep. was his home church, uh, but he had an uncle who was part of Azusa Street and became an Assembly of God pastor and uh, ended up working in some way or another for the Assembly of God denomination. I know he got to retire to Springfield, Missouri, which made him very happy. <laughs> and so um, just really good, uh, great parents, um, grateful for the influence in my life. Uh, Typical, typical parents in some ways made sacrifices for their sons. I have one brother, um, wanted us to have um, more than they had. And um, I think that was a very common sense still as, as a dad. I mm -hmm. wish the same thing for my boys. And, uh, and they, made, they made sacrifices to make that happen. You know, I went to, they put me in a Missouri Synod grade school, um, kindergarten through eighth grade. 
uh, had no idea how fortunate that would be and how much that would bless me uh, throughout my life. Started memorizing a verse a week as a kid uh, as part of as part of the religion classes. Um, starting in fifth grade, we had to start memorizing Luther's small catechism, um, fifth through eighth. Um, had quizzes regularly on the catechism, uh, church history, Old New Testament, starting fifth grade. Um, you know, when I got to seminary, um, I knew who the Maccabees were. I was one of the very few people in my <laughs> seminary class that knew who nice. heard of the Maccabees, right? Yeah. So, so it was, um, uh, it was, I'm very grateful for that. Ended up going then to uh, Catholic high school. Uh, grew up in an Italian Catholic neighborhood. I was an Irish Protestant. And everybody else in my neighborhood was an Italian Catholic. So the, the, rhythm, the rhythms of the church were very profound in my life. Um, you know, during Lent, um, the whole neighborhood would go down to what we called the grotto. And, um, and there would be outdoor stations of the cross. And uh, Catholic or not, everybody went. And mm-hmm. I went. Um, you know, I remember, and, 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 and in subconscious ways, the church influenced me. Um, I have four boys. And I don't know, a decade or so ago, uh, one of my sons was over on a Friday, and on Friday we eat salmon in my house. And my son said, "Dad, why do we eat fish every single Friday?" I'm like, "I don't know. You eat fish on Fridays. What kind of question is that?" And so, so just it, it just thoughtlessly influencing me, right? Just mm-hmm. um, uh, the rhythms of the life of the church um, profoundly shaped me, and um, so very grateful, very grateful for my upbringing. You know, my mom and dad moved into what they would have considered a starter home um, on the eastern suburbs of Cleveland. Um, but when they moved in there, they really liked their neighbors so much that um, none of them ever moved. Um, the only way my neighborhood dissolved is kids moved away and parents died. And so um, I don't think there's any anyone in that neighborhood left living there. Um, but I still stay in some communication with some of the folks I grew up with. Now, at some point, you met the one. This beautiful lady <laughs> walks in front of you. Uh, yeah. Tell me about that. Well, she was a beautiful 13-year-old when she first walked in front of me. Um, <laughs> and you were 13, um, too. <laughs> I was 15. I was 15. Okay, right. 13 was too young. It was, it was too young. But um, I was very involved in the Diocese of Ohio's youth program. Mm-hmm. And um, I was what was uh, they started a program called Group Leaders, and it was high school kids that that the Dawson program would train uh, to lead small group discussions and the conferences that the Diocese of Ohio would put on for as part of the youth program. And I was uh, same age and the same age as my sister-in-law, Jackie's uh, older sister, Silky. Uh, Jackie's Jackie's mother's from Coburg, Germany, and mm-hmm. so. Um, Silky is Silk was born there and uh, and has a German name, but um, I was friends with Silk and probably uh, it was later in the, one of the summers that we'd known each other. We'd all ended up over at her house. We were going to go up to a beach called Menor Headlands, and um, Jackie's mom said, "Well, Silky can go, but you have to take Jackie with you." And so um, Jackie ended up. And this this was back in the days when you didn't have to wear seat belts. You had bench seats in the front and back seats. <laughs> Uh, and so Jackie's uh, Silky's sister ended up on my lap on the ride to the beach, and um, and that may that got Jackie into my awareness. Um, Jackie and her sister went to an all girls. It was a boarding school, but they were day students, and their their bus would change buses at my high school, and so I would uh, often see Jackie and Silky on the way into school in the mornings and. And then conferences, and by the time we were both in high school, um, we started dating uh, a bit, and then broke up for a while. And um, and then I was working for the Diocese of Ohio out at their summer camp at this time with a good friend of mine, and we decided to meet her sister Silky at an Amy Grant in Chicago conference <laughs> at an outdoor concert venue <laughs> outside of Cleveland. <laughs> And lo and behold, Sokia brought Jackie with her. And uh, that was the first time that we, that was the first time uh, as college students that we reacquainted with each other mm-hmm. and, uh, and began dating and were married uh, within the year after that. Wow. That's great. Yeah. Let's move on to my, I got a whole list of questions. I hope you got sure. time. <laughs> Tell me about when you came to faith. It sounds like it was an early adventure for you. Yeah. You know, I think I'm, 
I think I'm a pretty normal average person in many, many ways. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I grew up in the church. I grew up in a, in a charismatic Episcopal church. Um, but that doesn't mean that faith comes any easier or is automatic. Um, I grew up in a very religious world between my grade school, my high school, my church world. And, um, but at some point, you have to obviously come to that moment of recognition where you uh, address the claims that Jesus made. Mm -hmm. And um, and and in high school, I'd had a, I'd had a experience at a Faith Alive weekend. Um, and and for me, what what really became clear at that moment was there was a dimension and a quality of faith that I did not know, and the people speaking were attributing it singularly to this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And, um, and my profound prayer at the time was, God, if this is real and if what they're talking about is true, I'd like to know this. And I would say God answered that, not in a Saul of Damascus way, but a continual um, growth and understanding of faith. Um, I'd say well, at the time I got to college, uh, when I went to college, very grounded in my faith, but as I got there, again, I think very typically, um, as a college student, I was thinking about new ideas um, and, and wanted to test and explore uh, world religions and sure. read my way through different world religions. Um, and during that time, um, it would be funny, I, I, would, I would still talk about Jesus, but I would talk about him with my friends as, I'm not sure I believe this but I would still essentially be sharing the faith with them in this process. I say that because several years later, um, one of my friends uh, had connected with my mother and said, hey, tell Steve that those conversations in college really helped and I'm walking with the Lord now. Uh, but at the time, I was working out my own issues, my own questions of faith, um, my, my wrestling with the moral claims of the gospel um, with, with my friends and the people that I would talk to. Um, I would say I wasn't doing well academically. I was doing fine in college, but I wasn't doing well spiritually. And uh, um, the priest who used to run the Diocese of Ohio's youth program, I'd, I was home for uh, maybe Christmas break. And he, um, I was just talking to him about I wasn't doing well. And I won't say quite angsty, but wasn't sure what I believed, didn't know who mm -hmm. I was. Um, and he, he suggested I move back home. And he said, if you do and transfer home, I was at Bowling Green College in Ohio. And he said, why don't you transfer home to Cleveland State and I'll put you on staff at the diocesan camp. And I lived out there and worked with him. And in that process, again, began to find questions answered. My heart began to find its rest in Christ, in the claims of Christ, and, um, and found, uh, found that sense of love and interaction, the personal nature of faith, sure. uh, again, in that environment. And it was in that environment as well that I'm reacquainted with Jackie. And um, and the two of us both being people of faith, um, growing again in our faith at that time. It was, it, was a, it was a good foundation for our life together as well. Mm -hmm. What church father do you most align with? Well, Augustine. Same. Yeah. Right? Surprise. Yeah. Surprise. <laughs> surprise, surprise. No. Um, I, liked it. I, I liked everything from it. Uh, you know, I liked the confessions because I could identify with mm -hmm. that, resonate with that. But I also liked his engagement with Pelagians. I liked um, I liked the way he articulated the faith. I liked the way he laid it out. It was an extraordinary foundation. It felt like a baton passed from Paul to Augustine for me and, yeah, then, yeah. Um, and then down to the Reformers especially so early in the formation of the church to have that right, right. Uh, Augustine. Exactly. Yeah, you know, very yep. powerful. All yep. right, let me look at my question page, and we're moving on here. Don't worry. Uh, oh, here, more relevant topics for you. Yeah, this this will be nice. To, um, without revealing too much, you, you know, the, the conclave is supposed to be secret. We get all that. But um, yep. what is the process internally there for, for choosing the archbishop? Um, you know, is there like an agenda? People get notes and papers. There's songs, readings. How does that um, work out? Yeah, a bit of all that actually. Uh, and and each conclave was different. This one was a little bit different than the one that Archbishop Bob had called to elect his successor. But mm -hmm. um, uh, very very simple format. Uh, all bishops, not just Austin's, but all bishops were invited to make a three minute presentation 
on where they thought the church was and where what they thought the need was in the moment and where we had a sense we might be called to go. And so um, we did that and that probably took a night in the morning. And then after that, we said our prayers um, and you know, we're meeting in the crypt at St. Vincent's. We're, we're in our cassocks. Um, it was hot. <laughs> Uh, it was the first time in my life I wore shorts underneath my cassock because it was so hot. Um, but um, uh, they take a nominating ballot, and uh, those names are revealed, and then we move into we move into balloting. And mm -hmm. you, we we would have extended times of prayer, silence. Uh, at times, we were encouraged to speak with one another, our delegation, or or some of those who had been nominated, and. Um, and we just, it was a very, very, very prayerful environment, which candidly for me was helpful um, because one of the things I did tell my colleagues was that I was willing to submit myself to their judgment and to their discernment um, early on that um, I, I could not find within myself, and I don't mean this in any negative way, but there was no, you have to do this or you can't do this. It was okay. Um, I'm at a point, it's part, of the, it's part of the obligation of being a diocesan bishop, that the possibility might exist where you are elected. And so I'd submitted myself to that many years ago. Um, I think the first time actually I had to submit to that was back when I was nominated to be bishop of the Carolinas. And I said no the first two times. And Archbishop, then Archbishop Bob called me and said, um, I would suggest that if you're nominated a third time, you submit yourself to the discernment of the larger body. Um, and I did that and was elected bishop. And so that posture really has shaped my episcopacy where I've willingly and unwillingly submitted myself to the prayerful discernment of my colleagues. And in this case, accepted what they prayerfully discerned. So how far into this conclave did you have your oh no moment? Oh, late. Oh no, I'm going to yeah, give you oh, no. well, <laughs> well, I mean, first there's an oh my moment when you're actually yeah. nominated, because I will I can tell you this part, I did not nominate myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, um, um, and I will also tell you, there were a ballot or two I didn't vote for myself. <laughs> and so, um, but as that process goes on, uh, I think the thought came, wow, this might really happen. And then the oh no moment was later on when it was like, wow, I think this is really going to happen. And, um, um, and it, it's an overwhelming, well, for me, I'll speak personally, it was an overwhelming moment for me. Um, um, I would not have shortlisted me on, on who would be the next archbishop. Not, uh, you know, I'm comfortable with who I am. Uh, and I, I, I have a good sense of my abilities and my weaknesses. There's guys in the college that are better theologians than I am. There's guys in the college that are better preachers than I am. Mm -hmm. um, I don't measure myself in those ways. I'm, I'm comfortable with the gifts that God's given me. I'm comfortable exercising in the arenas that God's placed me in. Um, and so for me, it was never a competition. Uh, it was never um, something you have to win. It was, um, you know, a little bit of Kierkegaard. There's a little bit of fear and trembling. Uh, in this process. And, well, I think the, um, the greatest philosoph philosophers tell us these those who seek it don't deserve it. Those mm. who do not seek it should be yeah. leaders, you know. Yeah. And so And uh, I would you know and, and the conclave was a, it, it was it was it was um it was a real extraordinary process. Um it's a different college than we had 10 years ago with mm -hmm. so many of our pioneering leader bishops uh, having retired and a next generation of bishops stepping in and so it was it was different but extraordinarily prayerful uh, centered in scripture centered in 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 the liturgies of the church um and um and just the process itself gave my first sense of reassurance that okay this may really be of the lord mm -hmm. so the election of a new archbishop does not just affect you and your family and your church it affects the office of the ACNA as well. Uh, sure. Currently located in Atlanta. What What are some of the uh, the things that have to happen now? Uh, well, I got to get into my uh, very pragmatically my provincial email account. Um, 
you know, uh, uh, we're a Google Docs world, a Google Suite, and now I got to learn Microsoft. I mean, mm-hmm. and I'm like, I'm 60. I just don't. Uh, so I got to switch suites. Um, mm-hmm. um, uh, I'll still continue to work with the provincial staff. Some are in Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Um, um, one's in Texas. One's still in Atlanta. Uh, but um, my my administrative assistant, Marshall, will step into the work that uh, Archbishop Beach's daughter had done on his mm-hmm. behalf. So getting her up to speed there, getting up to speed on provincial calendar events, um, planning, setting and planning the, the installation. Um, fortunately, though, and I say this because um, I think COVID uh, culturally had some benefit. And one of those benefits was this kind of world where yeah. where um, Zoom conversations or video conversations became um, more normal, more accepted. Uh, and also, you know, it's not always necessary to be in the same city to communicate about finances or other administrative structure. Um, I do, uh, I don't know how Archbishop Beach worked with the provincial staff, but I typically do a morning check-in with what's on the plate today. And then I do an afternoon check-in with, hey, here's what happened here. What else happened that I don't know? Um, I'm a fairly relational person. Um, and, and so I do, my normal life is spending a lot of time on the phone. Uh, or in Zoom calls, or face to face. Face to face is always best, but you know the Carolinas is geographically large enough that face to face conversations happen. But it's not easy to have all of them happen as frequently as you'd like. And so, um, so shifting those things over. So right now we are in the very technical things of getting Marshall up to speed with everything that is the responsibility of her new office. Um, getting me up to speed with everything that's a responsibility of mine. You know, um, I've highlighted the canons every time the word Archbishop appears. I'm reading them to make sure I know exactly what my responsibilities are. I, um, I also am big on boundaries. And so, um, so I will not overstep my boundaries or my authority uh, as an Archbishop, but I have to fulfill it clearly. And so, you know, even as a bishop, when I go to parishes, a congregation would say, oh, we wish you'd come more often. I said, well, you know, I can only come to your parish if your rector invites me. And um, because I, I, I grew rules. up in a world <laughs> was well, the rules. Right. Yeah. And I grew up, unfortunately, in a church that disregarded and overstepped the rules and, and led to catastrophic events. Mm-hmm. And no so I think one of the one of the best things I can do as archbishop is be an example of knowing and obeying our canons. Okay, you mentioned it. Uh, have you guys finalized the installation yet? Got any ideas when we're going to do this, where we're going to do this? We're trying. Um, I'd say the first obstacle we hit was lots of people are on vacation right now. And uh, so we're looking at, God willing, that last week, the midweek of October. That's the hope. Okay. Maybe Tuesday, Wednesday of that week. We're looking at a couple venues here in Charleston to see what might work. Um, St. Andrew's wouldn't be able to host it uh our capacity is probably right at 850 and so we're probably thinking of something a little bit bigger than that don't know for sure Mm -hmm. but certainly are expecting international guests um and regional definitely but i would expect others as well so we are we are at work with that we have a site planning team that is ready to meet with the various venues as soon as we can get the uh, confirmation from those venues that those dates are available and that we can come in and meet with them and um, probably probably looking at three practical places right now. And um, so I'm hoping in the next week we'll be able to nail this down. Mm-hmm. All right, a couple more questions here. Um, I asked my audience last week, I mentioned I was going to do an interview with them. I asked them if they had any questions and I was contacted by some members of the uh, ACA um, and they asked if there's any future relationship that we would be brought with uh, continuing Anglicans through your administration? Um, I mean, my hope is yes. Yeah. I mean, my, by nature, I'm a, re- I'm a relational person. By nature, I build consensus and I, I, um, I play well with others <laughs> and, and it's a value for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think, I think increasing unified Anglican witness is something that I would be very interested in. And so um, my my answer to anyone that wants to talk to me is, of course, I'll speak with you. And 
Um, thankfully, the ecumenical work that we have within the ACA under uh, Archbishop, uh, not Archbishop, under Bishop Ray Sutton and mm -hmm. under Eric Menice with the Catholic world and other bodies has been extraordinary. And I fully expect it to continue to grow and blossom under their leadership. So, it's, yes. You went into the next question. Uh, rumors are yeah. swirling regarding um, what happened right after, uh, was announced after Conclave that uh, Eric Menice has been able to uh, have good relationships with Roman Catholics and maybe down the road there could be a time when Anglican orders are recognized. Is this a rumor? Yeah. What are you? You're at the top. What have you heard? I'm at the top. I've heard <laughs> probably exactly what you've heard. I've okay. heard a report that going back to a Malta document um, that um, uh, at least once upon a time there was anticipation of that and I am under the impression now that uh, Bishop Eric and Bishop Rave had remarkable conversations with our Roman Catholic brothers and that they're uh, are going to pick up the threads of that conversation that ended a few decades ago. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you go back to my impulse, Jesus play, prayed that we all might be one. And my impulse is always to pursue unity uh, with others. Mm -hmm. Theological unity, right? I mean, it, yes, it, I, I, I'm, <laughs> my old Episcopal days are getting triggered. I was going to say <laughs> truth at the sake of unity. You, you, you're truth giving me PTSD. Yes, I know, right? <laughs> it, it just kicks in. <laughs> all right. So unity, um, big yeah. topic within the ACNA. Uh, we That's have non-geographical diocese. Um, yeah. I, a layperson, have complained about that since day one. You know, that, that doesn't show unity. That doesn't show to the world that the ACNA plays nice at all levels. Hmm. And, um, yeah, I always suggested maybe there could be a, a date that uh, the ACNA will not have those anymore. Is hmm. I know it's not in planning yet, but is that something uh, that could help unify the ACNA by having a non-geographical uh, date out yonder? Or geographical date? Um, yeah, I'm, I, I'd be loath to set a date. Um, I think that creates an artificial structure. Mm -hmm. um, and we can go back to our bit of our conversation a bit on both truth and unity. Um, I'd say there's enormous unity in the college centered around the person of Jesus Christ, the sacraments, the teaching of the church, our worship. Um, I have, we, we, there are certainly disagreements. Uh, there are certainly disagreements. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never been in a distasteful disagreement in the sense that it was um, yelling or, or that kind of frustration. I, I mean, we have principled disagreement. Sure. And so I believe, uh, and I hope that, I appreciate the honesty in those things. So our disagreements aren't personal. They're over understandings of the faith. Um, I am very clear that geographical uh, dioceses are the norm in Anglicanism, and they would be my ambition. But it's going to take ongoing conversation, and it's going to take ongoing prayer and relationship uh, to get there. Uh, there have been any number of examples of bishops handing over churches um, into other dioceses or from non-geographical into geographical. Uh, I think those exemplify the the heart of the college and the relationships that we share with each other uh, but there are principal disagreements right now that we are determined will not they're not going to threaten the acna as an, as an entity um, but by the same token we're going to have honest conversation and we've had it I and mean, we've had it all through uh, the victoria conclave it was it was difficult um, but we were able to speak to and with one another with charity and with clarity about the framework from which we operate under, in that case, it was the ordination of women. Um, and so, um, so I'm not threatened by non-geographical diocese and they don't, they're not a worry. Um, I do think that we will get to the place where geographical dioceses are the norm. Mm -hmm. I do remind people, um, our culture measures things in nanoseconds. Um, you know, you might be the hot topic trending on Twitter for a day, and then your old news, and people don't even remember whatever happened. 
with that. The church doesn't measure time like that. We measure time in decades and we measure time in centuries. centuries. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not, I'm not going to suggest this is going to take centuries for us to figure out. Um, but it's not going to be settled in a news cycle of our pop culture world either. Well, I mean, you you exactly described the last two weeks of Twitter, Facebook, mm. um, Instagram, that, oh, no, uh, they picked Steve Woods. It, it's going to cause a crash. Nobody uh, with elephant room issues is going to be able to handle this. And that's not true at all. I, I've spoken to every yeah. bishop within the ACNA over the last 10 years, and it's they'll tell you it's a tough topic. They'll tell it you is. it's not it's not a dividing topic. Exactly and, right. And the topic, you know, du jour is women's orders. You have a unique perspective on women's orders uh, that's not Anglo Catholic. That's not uh, um, anything other than. Well, why don't you explain your perspective? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, you I know, so again, for, you. for us, um, starting point is always scripture. Um, we certainly look at the tradition of the faith and what has been handed down to us. Um, but to the best of our ability, um, we try to make our decisions based on scripture, informed by our theology and our, our heritage. And so we in the Carolinas, as we were forming, uh, as we began working through these questions ourselves, um, we began, and, and, and again, the arguments are fairly well known. Uh, from an Anglo-Catholic mm -hmm. point of view, from a more Reformed point of view, right, uh, or Evangelical point of view. Um, they're generally well known. Um, and so recognizing that we held those positions, and the Carolinas was overwhelmingly an Evangelical Reformed point of view, um, we, we, we wanted to know how far could we go in our theological position amongst those that were forming the Carolinas before we felt our position was completely compromised or abrogated. And, um, and we ended up, and particularly from Paul's writing to Timothy and the use of the word kephali, the headship understanding, we, we ended up with a position where we could, uh, as a diocese, support the ordination of women to the priesthood, uh, but that the position of rector, head of a congregation, was restricted to a male. And, um, and we've, we've held that position from our inception uh, people have joined that position. Uh, we have a handful of women priests within our diocese. Um, and I'm not saying that aspirationally everybody's there, uh, but from a theological, what, what, what allows us to maintain our theological integrity, our understanding of headship, and, and be faithful to scripture, uh, we landed on, on this position. And so we do ordain women to the priesthood. Um, and but rector is, is restricted uh, to the office, uh, a male to the office of rector. Um, and I won't say it's uneasy in the sense that there's discontent. It's just reflective of the larger question of the church right now in the ACNA uh, of, of the role of women uh, in the ministry. And, um, and so that, that's, been a, that's been our posture for 10 years. Um, and, and we also understand, I would understand, uh, I really hold to a team leadership model at St. Andrews when I was rector or am rector. So I, um, um, I, I function with a team um, and I share everything. I, I am not in the pulpit every week. I don't celebrate communion every week. Mm -hmm. um, and that reflects my understanding that we, I and we at this parish, and I'd say in the diocese at this point, we, we function as a team. I have uh, a number of extraordinary associate clergy. I have uh, three other bishops that assist me in the Carolinas, and we operate typically according to our giftings. And so a team model of ministry in our world allows a member of that team also to be a woman in an ordained presbyteral role. All right, uh, back to, I got like two or three questions left. This should be yep. easy, easy. But actually, it's not the easiest question, but. Um, I'm sure not. <laughs> uh, back in May 24 of 2020, you co-signed yep. a letter, um, uh, a letter concerning the death of George Floyd and so many others. And uh, I was wondering if you had more time to reflect on that or um, 
uh, what would you t- speak to that same emphasis four years later? Uh, yeah, that was a that was a challenging time. Um, you know, uh, culturally, we were in the tail end, not the tail end, we were still in the throes of that round one of COVID. Um, mm-hmm. I was still obviously recovering from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the George Floyd event happened. And, um, um, and one of the things that moved me to engage uh, the other bishops that helped author that, and then out of that, I'd say most of the bishops signed it and passed it on to their own diocese as well. But one of the, the principal aim was to try to help our people think biblically and theologically, because everything my world was hearing was culturally and politically. And Christians were not being given framework through which to think. Well, some places certainly were, but largely in my world and in the world of the other folks, the other bishops that signed that letter, uh, it was cultural, socio-political commentary that was all we were hearing and defining sure. what had taken place. Mm-hmm. And so the intention was to at least introduce the idea that we have a biblical and faith tradition that can help us make sense of what we are uh, seeing and encountering and try to reframe it out of a secular socio-political understanding into a framework of faith. Um, and for the most part, uh, I feel okay with what we wrote. Uh, I probably today would not use the language of systemic racism. Um, one of my one of my favorite uh, political theorists is a man named Harvey Mansfield, who just retired from sure. Harvard. Yeah, and um, and I remembered uh, I remembered early in that game somewhere somewhere that summer I think he wrote an article, and he talked about that word being a new phrase for a new situation. And um, I don't think it's a helpful phrase uh, any longer, and it would not be one that I would use. But then also, as conversation partners uh, over the years, uh, Bishops Willie Hill, Al Gadsden, and William White, uh, all from the REC here in their Southeast Diocese, have become great conversation partners. And so for me, rather than having to think simply abstractly or reading through Harvey Mansfield or any other one else's critique, on cultural issues, uh, particularly racial issues. Um, I've had many, many conversations with Bishop Willie Al and William about that's their awesome. lived experience. Yes, and um, that is, and so, and again, that's that's the that's my instinct is to try to have conversations. So, so for the most part, yes, the letter for me hopefully accomplished a goal of helping people think or helping Christians understand we have resources to draw against. Right. Um, but also recognizing, you know, I, I probably would phrase things or would phrase things differently today. Oh boy. You're almost off the hook. I think I'm to the last question here. No, two more, two more questions. <laughs> what do you think the AC enable look like in 10 years? when you pass this on in a conclave to the next archbishop? Oh, boy. Um, I hope we are unified. Mm -hmm. I expect we will be uh, to build upon that. That was was one of the bedrocks of Archbishop Bob. Foley Foley set an incredible example when he talked about being an archbishop to all the people. And so Mm -hmm. my commitment is to be the archbishop for the whole of the church. Um, and so I unified biblical, uh, I don't worry about these things, but as I said in my opening or my first sermon as the archbishop, um, I do think it's important to rehearse the fundamentals. Um, and so my gentlemen, this is a football comment will hold true consistently. I think sometimes it's easy to forget that this is the football and, uh, start worrying about our uniforms or the bench or the locker room or the condition of the field and forget that. The football is the point, and so um, and so uh, unified biblical, and and I really anticipate. I, I think a lot of progress is going to be made in some of the areas that challenge us right now. Um, I wish I could more adequately express to you how extraordinary the College of Bishops are and the men that occupy the offices in the College of Bishops. Um, and for me to have seen personally, to have seen the first generation give way. 
I mean, I was probably a one A. You know, I wasn't. I certainly wasn't a general. You in were the a private in two thousand eight, uh, yeah, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, and so, uh, you know, so I came in on the tail end, but not replacing. Right, I was still. I'm still. I'm a first bishop. Yeah. Um, and so to, to see the transition, to see, to watch the manner in which our diocese go about the selection process for the next bishops of their diocese has been extraordinary encouraging to watch the manner in which the college, certainly we all have our groups of friends within the college, but we don't live in those groups. It is very common to have bishops and it's normative that we go out to dinner in our winter gatherings in January with anyone. And, and, um, and I think over the, over the years I've been in, so 12 years now, I guess, um, you know, you come in knowing about people, um, but then you begin to know them, right? And so one of the bishops I enjoy talking with is, 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 is a colleague who has, uh, is traveling with his son to all the different baseball parks in North America. And I love baseball. And so there's a, there's a richness that goes beyond just simply what our um, liturgical or theological preferences and convictions are. And, and, and we understand one another as men and as people and, and their families and uh, to pray for each other. So hopefully for me, it's the continuation in a direction that uh, always seeks to exalt Christ and, um, and that makes much of his glory and his surpassing glory. And, and for that to be our concern. What would you wish that this audience could pray for you as your time as Archbishop? I mean, mm. that you know yourself, and you certainly yep. know that um, uh, I would. I always need help in this area. Uh, yeah. And whether it's scheduling, whether it's travel, you know, what would you ask this audience for? Yeah, it's actually very good. I, I will overcommit myself. Um, I I like to work. And I can work myself into a position where I don't take care of myself. Uh, I got in a place there eight, ten years ago. I was in a very dark place. Uh, actually, uh, you know, we'd already we'd already come out of the Episcopal Church. The South Carolina Supreme Court had given us our property, and and you think I'd be happy, but I was miserable. And um, I remember coming home one day, and Jackie and I didn't say, you know, my my escapist thought for years was I'm just going to go be a lawyer. That's what I wanted to do anyway. I'll go be a lawyer. And I would talk about that to Jack when I would come home, just so frustrated with the lawsuits and the challenges we have to navigate. But at this point I came home and Jackie just looked at me. She said, you're going to quit. I said, what do you mean? She said, you're going to quit. I'm like, yeah, I'm about done. I've reached the end. Um, something was wrong with me. Didn't know what it was. And, um, and I ended up, you know, um, talked to a counselor for a while, but really ended up in kind of a pastoral spiritual direction setting. And then also ended up in a, in a two and a half year program of spiritual direction slash transformation that was Mm -hmm. met quarterly. And it, I got there because I will overwork. Um, I, I like work. Um, I find satisfaction in it. Uh, and so healthy, schedules, calendar, which can be difficult because there's a part of me all these years later being ordained when help is needed. There's part of me that feels uh, responsible uh, to respond in in Christ's name. So wisdom, wisdom to go with that would be second. Um, There are real challenges that face our church and, you know, and, and what God gave extraordinary wisdom to Solomon. So the Lord has extraordinary wisdom to give us. And there may be moments where I, where we as bishops, I as an archbishop, need Solomonic wisdom. And uh, the confidence that we have in that, that I have in that, is that um, we have a God who cheerfully, delightedly gives. Um, and I, I suppose lastly, um, and this was one of the, one of the, um, things I thought about is it became apparent that I was um, probably going to be selected as Archbishop. Um, I have eight grandchildren and I have a wife and I have um, given a lot to the church over 30 some years. And part of me had thought I was entering into a point now in my sixties where um, my family might um, have a little more priority in my time. And 
Uh, and so how I navigate that and how we figure out what are healthy and good family patterns where I can be part of my lives and my grandchildren as they grow up um, is something um, I would welcome prayer for as well. Would you honor us by giving us a blessing as we close out this interview? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm, Gracious Father, first, we just give you thanks for this time and thank you for the ministry of this uh, broadcast and for the many people as encouraged and reached over the years. And now, Lord, as we are gathered in front of our screens, I ask that in the name of the Father uh, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the rich blessing of Christ Jesus may be poured out upon every listener, pressed down, overflowing. And out of that overflow, we might be a blessing to this world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.